thank you so much for being here because if you didn't show up for any reason, I would probably have to move out of the community. So thank you very much. No, I am so, so, so sorry for being late. It's just, no, no, you're, you're going to make up for it. Okay. Uh, I was listening to some TV shows, which I always do. And I listened to podcasts, which I always do. Right. And I kept hearing this guy. And it wasn't just a regular guy. He really caught my attention because it was an unusual intelligence and, and an insightfulness that I was very impressed with. So I called up my friend, Anthony. Anthony Coates, who happens to be a political consultant, a very, a very well-established and a very successful political consultant. And I said, Anthony, you've got to check this guy out. And Anthony said to me, he's a friend of mine. We talk all the time. And I said, is there any way we could get this guy to join Ali, not to join Ali, to speak with Ali? And he said, I'll talk to him. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit, if you don't know already, Stuart Stevens is a presidential and congressional campaign advisor, a political consultant, and a strategist. He's written, I think he just writ, he wrote his, I think, seventh book. The title of the book, and you can figure it out for yourself, it's called It Was All a Lie. He's been in every, I won't even name the uh, newspapers and the magazines, just think of one, and he's been in it. He's also involved in uh, writing for television shows, uh, Northern Exposure, Commander-in-Chief, K Street, and... Uh, He's been the strategist for names that you might recognize, Romney, McCain, Dole, Bush. And uh, with that, I'm going to be quiet. He's going to tell us stuff. I'm sure you're going to find him as fascinating as I do and did. And then uh, we can prob probably do questions and answers. Um, well, look, it's, it's great to be here. Um, is there a particular... Uh, a series of questions or directions that you would like me to, to, to go in? Because I can talk all day. Um, I want to make sure I, I address what you're most interested in. Um, well, I, I would suggest, why don't you talk a little bit about what's in your book and talk yeah. a little, little bit about your political mm -hmm. background and what you see is happening in the country in an American politics. Great. Um, I just wanted to make sure that's, that's what I, I thought would be best. Um, well, first of all, it's great to be here. I apologize for being late, but we had a, a in our little Lincoln Project group, we had uh, someone who tested positive for COVID and we had to throw on this emergency testing. And so that was what delayed me. Um, this is an odd moment in my life. Um, uh, just to give you a little background on myself, I grew up in Mississippi. I'm actually a seventh generation Mississippian. Um, and I, I grew up in Mississippi when there were only Democrats and they were sort of the old line segregationists like Jim Eastland and um, John Stennis. Um, I got involved in Republican politics because there was a young congressman who was the first Republican elected from Mississippi since Reconstruction. It was sort of an alternative to those old line segregationists. Uh, I was a page in his office and then I worked for him, a guy named Thad Cochran. Um, and, uh, I ended up getting involved in, uh, I was always interested in sort of three things, politics, film, and writing. And I've been lucky enough, and most of it is luck, to be able to pursue each of those uh, uh, professionally. Um, and I fell into the category of working in campaigns making television commercials. Um, and I could do it at a time, sort of like labor migrant work, where no one would pay me to write or anything, but I could go work in campaigns. Um, and I just continued it. Uh, eventually, I got where I could get published, but I found that I liked doing the campaigns. It was very different than politics. Um, and it uh, uh, was something I did for decades. Um, you know, the secret to success in political consulting is to work for people who are going to win anyway and just not screw it up. And uh, I realized that pretty early, and I was lucky enough to work for really good candidates, I thought. Um, I worked in five presidential races. Um, went down to Austin in April 99 and worked for uh, then Governor Bush, uh, stayed through our glorious landslide. Um, 
wrote a book about it called The Big Enchilada. Um, and I worked uh, Mitt Romney's campaign, we lost. Um, and after that, I wrote a book about uh, spending a whole uh, fall football season with my father, who was in 95, going to these college football games called The Last Season. And I really didn't think I'd ever get involved in another presidential race. Um, but then in you know, 2016, um, Trump ran and won. Um, a lot of people were wrong about Donald Trump in 2016, but it's hard to find anybody who was more wrong than me. Uh, I didn't think he'd win the, the primary. I didn't think he'd win the general. And after he won, I went through a period of sort of saying to myself, well, you know, like a lot of my friends, he's not really a Republican. Um, but I don't really see how you can sustain that. Um, he is the Republican Party. I mean, the Republican Party is the party that endorsed uh, Roy Moore and attacked uh, John Bolton. Um, so I started asking myself, how did this happen? And that's really what led me to the quest to write this book, It Was All a Lie. Um, it was a very personal quest. Uh, and that sort of, since your high school English told you, high school English teacher told you that if you couldn't write something, you really didn't understand it. So I did it trying to understand it. Um, I think I have a better sense. Uh, I can't really say I completely understand it. I, I watched something like last night, and I still am just stunned. Um, but what became clear to me was that there was always these two strands to the Republican Party that in the post-World War II era. Call it like an Eisenhower strand and then a, a McCarthy strand. And that the two uh, existed in a uh, separate but related world. Um, Eisenhower was sort of the governing, boring, sane side, and then you have, um, you know, a crazy side like McCarthy. Um, those of us who, who worked for uh, Governor Bush, President Bush, I mean, I think it's safe to say that we saw this dark side, but we always thought that the side that we were on was the inevitable side. Um, and it, uh, if only because the country was changing so much. Uh, that we, we'd have to go in the direction we went. Um, but we, I think it turns out we were wrong. Uh, we turned out to be the recessive gene and the other was the dominant gene. And in this book, I, I talk about how race is really the original sin of the modern Republican Party. And I, I think that's certainly continues to be proven. And we saw it again last night. And, and you know, 1956, Dwight Eisenhower got almost 40% of the black vote. Then it dropped to uh, 7% for Goldwater in uh, 1994, uh, uh, 1964. Um, and you could have made a case, I probably would have if I hadn't been like six years old at the time, um, that African Americans would drift back to the party in some numbers because of shared values of faith, uh, entrepreneurship, patriotism, um, personal freedom, but it just never happened. Um, Goldwater got 7%. Uh, uh, Trump got maybe seven and a half to eight percent. So at that rate, Republicans would be doing better with African Americans about 30, 70. Um, and I think what the party became increasingly a white party. And uh, in the Bush era, we acknowledge this as a huge failure. I mean, we talked about being a big tent. Ken Melman, who was chairman of the Republican Party, went before the NAACP in 2005 and apologized for the Southern strategy. And after Romney lost, we went through this process of a so-called autopsy of trying to analyze why it was we'd only won the popular vote once since 1988 um, in the 2004 race with George Bush. Um, and the answers were pretty simple. We had to appeal to younger voters, appeal to more non-white voters, appeal to more women, particularly single women. Um, and that was presented not only as a political necessity, but a moral mandate. Um, and uh, that if you're going to earn the right to govern in this big, growing, cacophonous, uh, loud, contradictory country, you needed to reflect that more. Um, and then Trump came along and we just kind of threw it out the window. It was almost like an audible sigh of relief, like, thank God, we can win without having to pretend we care about this stuff. Um, and now the party has settled into a very comfortable white grievance. I mean, last night I thought was one of the darkest moments in modern American political history. We had a president of the United States who was calling out to these 
thugs, racist thugs, the Proud Boys, you know, to stand by. Um, but we've never seen anything like this. Um, so there, you, we formed the Lincoln Project, which really is just a group of former Republican political consultants. And, you know, we really had three choices in this race, either to be for Trump, which, well, that wasn't going to happen, or do nothing, which kind of sucked, or you know, try to use these skills we developed, um, for better or worse, to try to beat Trump. And, and that's what we've done. Um, and, you know, the, the, the group, we're incredibly grateful and humbled by the response it's gotten, a tremendous response. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we laugh. Sometimes Trump goes out and attacks us in the Lincoln Project, and we just laugh about it. I mean, like, are you kidding? Like, we're political consultants. We wouldn't vote for ourselves. Um, it's not, we're not a candidate. So um, we're just working to defeat Trump and Trumpism. Because I think Trumpism has is, is become ingrained in the party much more deeply than just Trump. Um, and I think history tells us that when a major political party endorses this kind of anger and hate, it's very difficult to undo. Um, and I think it's going to take a long time. And we intend to be around for a long time trying to help that. Um, so that's sort of where I am now and how I got here. Um, and, and love to answer any questions. Um, Stuart, I have one question in the chat. Why are so many Republicans supporting Trump no matter what he says or does? Man, I ask myself that question only about 10 times every hour. Um, you know, the answer is probably that there's not one answer. Uh, it's probably a combination. Uh, part of it is just sort of tribal almost sports-like loyalty. Um, I think part of it is uh, there's some genuine feeling that Democrats would be much worse for the country, even with a flawed president as, like Trump. Um, I think that there's a, <sighs> there is, uh, I, I think, uh, this really unfortunate view with Republicans, a lot of Republicans, that um, the country is changing in a way that endangers our status, uh, that makes it more uh, difficult for us to live the life that we have a right to live. Um, and I think that's extraordinarily uh, unfortunate um, because America is changing so rapidly. I mean, if, if I came across a statistic the other day that just blew my mind. Among Americans who are 15 years old and under, the majority are non-white. And odds are really good they're going to turn 18 and still be non-white. Um, and that's just a, a death knell for the Republican Party as it's currently established. And what a, a political party needs to do is change and embrace change. I mean, one of my favorite clients uh, was a Mississippi politician named Haley Barber, who was elected governor. And before that, he ran the Republican Party. And Haley used to say, you know, be for the future, it's going to happen anyway. And that's what the Republican Party has sort of forgotten. And, and we're trying to sort of claw our way back to the past or stop time. And it's just not going to work. It doesn't work. I mean, you can build all the walls in the world. You can have all the Stephen Millers. You're not going to stop demographic change in America. Um, you're trying to boil the ocean and it's just not going to work. So a sane party would embrace it. Um, and ultimately I think the Republican party, and it'll probably still be the Republican party, but I think it'll change a lot. There is a need for a center right party in America, but right now, I mean, look, I worked for this party for decades, the highest levels. If you held a gun to my head and said, tell me what, conservatism stands for. I, I just tell you to shoot me. I don't have the faintest idea. I mean, I thought it stood for personal responsibility, character counts, free trade, strong on Russia, strong against dictators, uh, very pro-legal immigration. Ronald Reagan announced in front of the Statue of Liberty and uh, signed a bill that made everybody uh, before 1983 legal. Um, that's the party I thought it was. 
disagree on some issues here or there, but there were these bedrock principles. I, I, I don't know any conclusion but to come to, but th those were marketing slogans, not values. Because I, I, you ask yourself, how do people change deeply held beliefs in three, four, five years? I, I think the answer is they don't. It just means they weren't deeply held. Um, so, I, you know, if you, you look at someone like Elizabeth Warren, she can articulate a theory of government. You can hate it, you can love it, but you can argue with it. Uh, and, and she'll argue back and she'll be really good. Uh, you, I don't know anybody who can do that credibly on the, on the center right. I really don't. I mean, you can argue what you wish the party was. I mean, I can do that all day, uh, but it's, it's not what the party is. Um, and I, I just, you know, I know so many of these people, the, you know, senators in particular, uh, that I helped elect. I mean, they're good people. You know, they move next door, they'd be great neighbors. Um, and I don't get it. I don't get why they don't stand up to Trump. Um, but I, I think it's going to be something that will be looked at for a long time uh, as a, a really dark period. Agreed. John, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, just let me make a comment on it, too. I mean, I'm, I have, I've lately gotten the uh, impression that a lot of the Republican uh, politicians uh, are really more interested in maintaining power and staying in office and doing what is right for our country, uh, no matter what, you know, is going on. And, and yep. that disturbs me. I mean, there's so many issues that have come up where it was clear and obvious, you know, what was the right thing to do. But if Trump, you know, Trump said, no, 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 I'm opposing that, they would go along with it. I agree, man. I agree. I, I, I you know... I, I say the Republican Party doesn't really exist as a political party now. It exists as a cartel. Its purpose is to defeat Democrats. To no purpose. No articulable, organized political thought with coherence. I mean, nobody asks OPEC what's its greater good. It's like they sell oil. I mean, and so I really think that's what's happened with Republicans. Um, I, I, and you know what amazes me, John? You know, you talk to these people, and since Trump emerged, I have yet to talk to one elected Republican who will tell me that Donald Trump is qualified to be president. Not one. I mean, I, I, probably they're out there, the Jim Jordans of the world. You know, I just don't know these people. You know, I didn't work that side of the street. Um, but, I mean, you take Nikki Haley of South Carolina, someone I once, you know, looked to as possible future of the party. You know, she stood there with, when she endorsed Marco Rubio in the South Carolina primary in 2016 and said, we can't have a president who uh, instantly can't denounce the KKK. We can't have that. And now she's with Donald Trump. And, you know, Donald Trump is out there calling out the Proud Boys last night. I don't get it. Um, you know, one of the most disturbing books I read when I wrote this book, and the best thing about writing the book was sort of an excuse to read other books, um, was the memoirs of this uh, German-Prussian politician, Franz von Papen, who really more than anybody else was responsible for ushering Adolf Hitler into power and acceptance by the aristocracy. And even in 1953, when he wrote this memoir, and I'd urge everybody to read this thing. You can get it on Kindle, believe it or not. I have no idea why, but um, you can. Um, he is still trying to justify Hitler in 1953, saying, you don't understand, we were facing the Bolsheviks. And if we hadn't had Hitler, Germany would have become Bolshevik. Um, we were Prussian aristocrats. We couldn't relate to the working class and what they were going through. Hitler could. We needed him to come in and to be able to um, rally people to stop them from becoming communists. I mean, that's 1953. Um, and it's not to say that what's gonna happen in America is, is, we're not, we're not Germany. We have stronger institutions. We're not gonna end in a world war. But it's that same mentality that somehow smart people justify doing something they know is wrong. Uh, for supposed greater good. 
But I actually think it's just self-interest. I think it's exactly what you said, John. I think it's just power. Power to no purpose. Um, and I don't, I don't get it. You know, say what you will about most politicians. They have pretty big egos. Which, I mean, that doesn't bother me. I mean, so do great musicians, athletes. God knows writers do. Um, but I don't understand why they don't grasp how they're going to be remembered. And I don't mean 20 years from now. I mean two years from now, probably. A year from now. Maybe half a year from now. So what if you lose a primary? I mean, who would you rather be? You'd rather be the person that was a segregationist until 1968, 69, or a Mississippi or Alabama politician who stood up and even if you lost your, your seat, came out against uh, segregation. I don't get it. All right, Stuart, we have about <clears throat> 12, 12 questions and some hands up. So I'm just Great. get moving here. Joel Ryder, you wanna unmute yourself, Joel? Yes, hi. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah, um, as I said, I'm a Trump hating Republican. I literally, I didn't sleep half the night last night. I, I was well, so upset. Um, I'm about, about to leave the party. And I guess my question to you, is there any hope for the Republican Party? Where are the Reagan Republicans? I'm, I'm really at my wit's end. I don't think I'll ever become a Democrat, probably an independent. But I, I don't know really what to do at this point. I, it's just so sad. I was just so sad last it, night. Listen, I feel like I'm watching a friend drink themselves to death. <laughs> you know, it's incredibly sad. Um, I, you know, I, I think everybody's got to find their own path in this. Um, you know, someone like Michael Steele, who used you know, to be chairman of the party. Right. Um, Michael's view on this, look, I've been a Republican 40 years. You know, I, was Af I am African-American. It hasn't been the easiest thing. I'm not going to let Donald Trump run me out of this party. I'm going to run Donald Trump out of the party. I really admire that. Personally, I'm not there. Um, to me, when we talk about there being, you know, why isn't there a third party in America? To me, there really are three parties. There's a Republican party and then there's two parties inside the Democratic party. Um, you know, sort of an AOC, Sanders wing, and then call it a Bidenist. I think that the future of American policy terms for the next foreseeable future is going to be decided by that battle inside the Democratic party. I mean, if you take like national health insurance, I mean, it, 10, 20 years, are we really going to be the only Western country that doesn't have national health insurance? It's hard to imagine. And what that's going to be is going to be decided by that battle inside the Democratic Party. I mean, we've seen Republicans just say no. And to me, the bleak view of this, but I think it may be the right view, is what happens to the Republican Party in California. So, I mean, it wasn't long ago the Republican Party was in California. That was the beating heart of the Republican Party. It was our electoral citadel. And now we're in third place, not second, third. And, you know, even more troubling, there's really not any large public policy issues that Republicans really have play a role in. Um, I fear that's what's going to happen. Um, to me, it's kind of like the subprime mortgage crisis, you know, I mean, it's easier to predict how it ends and how long it takes. Maybe, you know, Trump could win. Mm. God um, forbid. God forbid. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the last, it's hard to beat an incumbent president. Um, if he wins, I really fear for our country. True, truthfully, not, nothing like I've ever seen in my life. It's just unbelievable. I, I, you know, I find myself in this odd position that, you know, you work in politics and people always have these conspiracy theories and you always just laugh at them because mostly politics is pretty boring. It's just kind of blocking and tackling and, you know, getting people out to vote. And, um, I think this period between now and the end of this election, whenever that is, is the most dangerous period in America since the Civil War. I agree. I, I call Trump the Fuhrer in training. I know it's it's very polarizing, but I, I, he's just a scary I, individual. I, can't, I think you're exactly right. And, and yeah. further evidence is the fact that the party didn't even have a, a platform. Mm. It just had basically a Fuhrer oath. I mean, you had to be inside these party platform fights. I mean, they were like, street fights people cared so much about. I mean, you could argue it was silly that really maybe the platform didn't matter that much. But I mean, there's people whose whole lives are bought around fighting for the platform and they just walk away from that. 
I, I mean, I, I just couldn't imagine that, and yet it's happened. Yeah. Um, so, listen, if you really want to get depressed, just in case you're not depressed enough, <laughs> um, take, take 20 minutes and read, uh, you can get on the internet, um, George Bush's acceptance speech at the 2000 Republican Convention in New York. Uh, written by a guy who's now a columnist for the Washington Post, Michael Gerson, who's a beautiful writer. Um, you read that, and it, it reads like a document from a lost civilization. Hmm. I mean, it's all about humility, service, compassion, uh, a duty to serve, helping others. I mean, that message couldn't win 10% of the Republican primary every day. Um, it's astounding. And to that, to what we saw last night, um, I, it's just, uh, I, I, I don't think, it's always hard when you're in the middle of a moment to really understand the moment. Um, but I don't think that we've ever seen a collapse of a major political party in American history as we've seen the collapse of the Republican Party. I, I can only compare it to the collapse of the Soviet, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union where sort of what it said it stood for and what it actually delivered to people became so different that it just sort of collapsed in its own. And if you watch Chernobyl, you can just see it happening, you know. Um, and I think that's what's happened to the Republican Party. Um, and it's, it's, it's incredibly disturbing. Okay, we have some other questions. On that cheery note, right. <laughs> what was that? On that cheery note, well, yes. Susan asked, can anything be done to undermine Trump's undermining the election process? Yes, crush him. That's the best way. If this is 1964 and he's Barry Goldwater, all the king's men and all the king's horses can't change the results. If it's 2000, it's gonna be very bad, very bad. I mean, I worked for Bush in 2000 and went to that whole horrible recount period. And one thing you can say is both of those men, Bush and Gore, were prepared to lose and respected the process. I mean, when the Supreme Court decision came down, Al Gore told his staff, don't trash the Supreme Court uh, because he knew there was something bigger at stake here than just him becoming president. Um, I, I, you know, Trump tests people. He's tested Barr. Barr is his Roy Cohn. Uh, and he's tested the Republican Party. And I think the Republican Party will go along with almost anything Trump says. But you can't do it. Look, if, if we win Florida, uh, Biden wins Florida, it's over. And Florida counts their votes as they come in. So we'll know Florida, unless it's super, super close, we'll know Florida by probably 11 at night. And if Trump loses Florida, this thing's over. I mean, mathematically, it's possible for him to win losing Florida, but it, I mean, it, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, I think this is one of the reasons Bloomberg smartly is putting $100 million in the floor. Um, it's sort of a firewall against chaos. Um, so that's, that's the way to do it. Just crush him. Someone asked if you think Trump's performance last night was planned, and if so, what did he think he would accomplish, and, and did it work? That's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, one of the people, well, the person leading his debate prep was former Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, who was a client of mine. I worked on all his races. So Chris Christie was, you know, the youngest U.S. attorney. Um, I think he won every case. Uh, was governor, popular as governor, had some issues at the end, but popular. Uh, very smart, very good uh, debater himself. I can't believe that Chris Christie uh, advised him to do what he did last night. Um, I, I think there is this tendency with Trump uh, to somehow think what is going on is some complicated strategy you know, fifth dimension chess or something. When in fact, he, he's just a blithering idiot. Um, and I, I think that uh, he's very uncoachable. He has very little range. 
I think you can, he, he's sort of gonna say the same thing. It's just a question, will he say it louder or softer? Um, he'd be a terrible candidate to try to work with. Um, so I think to the degree that there was a strategy, it was to go in and crack Joe Biden. And it is exhausting if you've ever had a conversation with somebody who's interrupting you like that. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just mentally, physically, it's just, you know, to stand up, it's just exhausting. So I think they, if there was a strategy, it was, we're going to do this and then Biden is going to crack and make mistakes and then we can say Biden, Biden's lost to D.C. Now. That didn't happen. I thought Biden got stronger as it went on. Um, and, you know, if you remember that first Bush-Gore debate in 2000, you know, I was in the room with the Bush people and we could hear next door, we were at the Kennedy Library in Boston, uh, the Gore people. And they thought they had won. Um, because Gore, if you read the debate, Gore did very well. But if you saw it, he had this sort of condescending attitude. Remember, he kept sighing too much. You know, they later said he'd had like a dozen Diet Cokes before he went on and was like all ramped up. Um, he just didn't like the guy. And that cost him the debate. He lost that debate. Um, and last night when Trump, the thing started, and you know, there are a lot of people, you know, I was getting all these messages from friends and stuff like, you know, Biden's not fighting back. It, it you know, Trump's going to kill him. And I was like, no, I think Trump's killing himself. I don't think he liked this guy. I mean, this is a guy you wouldn't sit next to on a plane. Um, and that matters a lot. And by the end, uh, I think Trump was, was sweaty and, uh, you know, as someone said in one of these focus groups to Frank Luntz did, he looked like a crackhead. Um, so I, I, I think probably, you know, let's let this settle out for a few days, but I think it's probably gonna go down as the most devastating debate performance uh, by a candidate in modern uh, presidential debate history. Here's a question about Biden. I think, Bob Ober, if you wanna ask it, are you there, Bob? Yeah, I, you know, I thought that Biden's prep was not good. What do you think? And I would have answered several questions and particularly comments from Trump much differently, for I example, know. when he said, you know, you're not very smart. I, if I was Biden, I would have said, yeah, I may not be smart, but I didn't have to have somebody take the SATs for me to get into college. <laughs> and when he talked about the forest burning in California and it was Newsom's responsibility, I would have said, yeah, except 57% of the forest in California is federal land, and that makes the National Forest Service and you responsible on your watch. He didn't say anything like that. I know those would have been great answers. Um, look, um, you know, when you do these debate preps, and I've done a lot of them, it's kind of like you stand on the field, kind of like a coach is called to play, and then the whole thing kind of goes. <laughs> it's like, guys, please. Um, but at the end, you know, um, it's the totality of it. And, and I think that what you came across was um, Biden never made a big mistake. And I think he had some moments that were uh, straight from the heart. I thought a couple of his best moments was when he talked about his son, both defending uh, uh, Bo, who's, who's now dead, um, and Hunter, who's had a lot of problems. I, I, I think that resonated with you know, every parent in America. Um, and across the Midwest and uh, West Virginia, New Hampshire, where they've had these opiate crises, there's not, there's not a family there that hadn't been touched by it. Um, and I thought he had a great moment when he talked about the suburbs. I think this is a fundamental miscalculation of Trump, the way he see, you know, when he talks about suburban housewives, and being afraid of, you know, basically black people moving into the suburbs. You know, I know a lot of women like you live in the suburbs. I don't know any of like to call themselves suburban housewives. I mean, most of them are working two or three jobs and, you know, don't have a spare moment. Um, and I don't know any who wouldn't want their kids to look at them as someone who, if somebody moved in next door, it's a different ethnicity or different religion, they wouldn't welcome them. I mean, you don't want to be that person. Um, and I think Trump, I thought Biden, when he says, you know, it's not the 1950s, it's not what you think. I think he's right. Um, so, 
you know, if you think of it like as a football game, you know, it was always this play, that play. But at the end, what was the total? And I, I think Trump really hurt himself. Um, I think I think that's what the numbers are going to show. But it is frustrating. Sorry, Doug, you had a question. Unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, today there's a uh, headline in the New York Times, the headline, and it says that the debate showed that the biggest threat to the election is Trump himself. Mm -hmm. And in another article, um, it, it takes a look at voter suppression, and it says that the article said that it, the Bush-Gore uh, vote count in Florida in 2000 is the beginning of modern day voter suppression because they talked about how Republican demonstrators and then ultimately the Supreme Court prevented a recount. But my question is, is the Lincoln Project focusing on defeating election fraud? I know you guys yeah. are doing wonderful work. I'm a fan of Steve Schmidt. Probably you know him. Um, I, I, was, and I, I think you guys are doing great I work. I'm wondering if you're working on uh, defeating election fraud. Yes, is the answer. We have a whole um, group uh, uh, directed at that, um, including a couple of people uh, who we brought in, uh, or they volunteered, um, who have worked extensively in Eastern Europe, which is very useful because Trump's model here is, is um, Belarus, it's you know, what tried to happen in the Ukraine. Um, it's Hungary, uh, it's Putin, that's the model. Um, so yes, uh, you know, we have this um, streaming television now. We have a show uh, three days a week, we're gonna go to five days at noon and at night. And particularly the noon show uh, is really focused on voter education. Because a lot of this is educating people about how to avoid their vote not counting. Um, be it just in the simple process of so-called naked ballots with uh, mail-in ballots, how your ballot has to be inside another envelope. Um, knowing where to register, when to register, uh, when to vote. Um, there's a huge informational qual uh, process here. Um, so um, we're doing everything we can on that. Um, on a reassuring note, you know, Republicans are out there talking about how they have thousands of lawyers and they're preparing to fight this. And you don't hear as much from the Democrats. I think that's delivered on both sides. I think the Democrats have this army of lawyers. I know they do. They don't talk about it because to talk about it is to, is to say that this is what the election is going to be decided by. And first of all, no one's going to vote for you for that reason. So it kind of gets in the way of your message. Trump has a larger purpose. He wants to delegitimize an election that he thinks he's going to lose. Because he wants to be able to spend the rest of his life hanging out at Mar-a-Lago Mar -Lago saying he lost a crooked election. He'll never admit that this was a legitimate election. Which, of course, for President of the United States to do that is extraordinarily destructive for democracy itself. Extraordinarily. Um, and it's shameful. And it's shameful that Republicans allow it to happen. Uh, it's what Putin wants. Putin wants to believe that democracy in the West doesn't really exist, that it's crooked. Uh, that hasn't changed since you know, the Soviet Union days. Um, I, I think voter suppression is very real. Um, I'll give you an example. In 2016, Trump won Wisconsin by just under one vote, 1%. 2012, Romney lost Wisconsin by seven points, not particularly close. But here's the deal. Mitt Romney got more votes than Donald Trump. So what was the difference? The difference was 40 to 50,000 votes in the greater Milwaukee area that didn't show up, who largely would have gone for Hillary Clinton. Part of that was uh, last minute voter ID laws that were put in place. And voter ID laws are something, 
to most of us just seem logical. Because let's be honest, most of us live in a world in which people have IDs and it's not a big deal. But there are millions of people out there, it is a big deal. And they don't have IDs. And the process of getting an ID is complicated. It costs money. Um, there's a very good organization uh, that focuses just on helping people get IDs. Uh, but it's a world that, frankly, most of us don't have insight into. But it's there. Um, and there really isn't voter fraud in America. Look, I, I've done this. I've done this a long time. I have never known an election that remotely was affected by voter fraud. I mean, it's a felony. Think about it. I mean, our problem in America is we can't get people to vote when it's legal. So we're really going to get people out there that are wake up in the morning and go, yeah, I want to commit a felony. I think I'll like, you know, go vote. I mean, it's an absurdity. Uh, is there, is, you know, is there voter fraud? Sure. Is there elephantitis in America? Yeah, there is. But there's a reason we don't have a you know, National Elephantitis uh, Foundation, but we have National Cancer Foundations. It's just not really a problem. Um, so, and Trump himself, you know, they, he came up with this crackpot uh, commission to look into voter fraud, and they had to quietly disband because they didn't find any. Um, so uh, there's a very good book I'd recommend you read that this woman who's a professor at UNC wrote, uh, Carol Anderson, called uh, One Person, No Vote. It is the best current uh, analysis of both the history of, of voter suppression and the current reality of voter suppression. Um, and you know, the, the truth is that voter suppression in the way it exists now, it's really more focused on income levels rather than race. It, it, it disadvantages everyone at the bottom end of the scale, but that disproportionately affects non-whites because they're disproportionately more economically disadvantaged. Um, so, you know, I, I'm. There's a lot of problems in life that money can't solve, but I think it's disgraceful that we don't spend more money on our elections. I mean, if I rule the world, I, I would spend a lot of money, federal money on elections. We shouldn't leave it to states. And you know, states don't have elections equally within the state because so many of it's run by volunteers. And I think we're headed for potential real problem this uh, November. You know, disproportionately, the number of volunteers are, are people who are 65 and older. And the risk to people 65 and older for COVID is exponentially greater. And they're going to volunteer to go be poll watchers and to run these things. You know, we have an effort where we're recruiting people actively to volunteer to, to work in their polls. Um, so, you know, most places where wealthy people live, you don't wait in line to vote. Um, it's not true uh, in poor areas. Um, and we could fix that and we ought to fix it. And, you know, 2018, you saw people willing to stand in line for hours and hours and hours. And you've seen it in special elections, like uh, in these primaries, you know. Um, so, but we shouldn't make it that hard. So, so I, I, it's, it's, it's an issue. Okay, Stuart, I have a lot of other questions. I'm gonna get, would it be possible to cut Trump's microphone if there are future Biden debates? This would be just when Biden speaks. Yeah, you know, the Commission on Presidential Debates just issued a statement saying that they were looking at changes. And I would be shocked if that wasn't one of the changes. Um, okay. Yes. And do you see Biden beating Trump? Do you see Trump protesting the election if he loses, bringing it before the Supreme Court, or inciting his supporters to take it to the streets? I see two out of three. Uh, I think, I think uh, Trump is going to lose. Um, I think the odds of it being a big defeat are much, much greater than a small victory. Um, 
the uh, I don't think this will end up. I don't think it's going to be close personally. Uh, so I don't think it'll end up in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, I think yes, uh, he, he will urge his people out. Yes, um, and I think there'll be violence. Um, yes, um, I don't think it'll be determinative. Um, but yes, he's a dangerous man. Why are so many women supportive of Donald Trump considering his history of sexism, adultery, et cetera? I'm the wrong person to answer that. I, I ask women. I, it's, 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 inco it's inconceivable. Yeah. But, but, I, but it's inconceivable to me that a man supports him. I mean, on that issue alone. I mean, here's someone who said last year that he didn't rape this journalist, E. Jean Carroll, who came forward because, quote unquote, she wasn't his type. And he's now fighting a DNA test uh, that could prove that he raped her. And I know E. Jean Carroll. We've written for the same magazines. Uh, e. Jean Carroll would never lie. I mean, in our little writing world, she's like famous for being obsessive about details. Um, I just find that extraordinary. How do you support someone who says he didn't rape someone because he wasn't his type? I, I, I don't see how you appear in public with that person. I, I don't. Look, you know, they limited the audience last night because of COVID, but it is, it sounds like a joke or some sort of sad attempt at humor, but it is a true statement that had you filled that audience with the women who have credibly accused Donald Trump of sexual assault, it would be one third of the audience. I don't get it. I, 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 I don't get it. When the Republicans say we and our, whom are they referring to? Say it again. Question is, when the Republicans say we and our, to whom are they referring? Well, white people, I would say. I mean, when they talk about, you know, our country, that's what they're talking about. It's become a white grievance party. Um, yeah, I think that's clear. That's the whole premise of Make America Great Again. Yeah. The idea that, you know, some Shangri-La period in the past, you know, 1950s or something, America was great. I mean, I don't know. I grew up in Mississippi, it's 40% black. I don't think it was so great for them. It's a lot better today than it was, and still very imperfect. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew asks a question, are there one or two key issues that may sink Trump? COVID and the economy. I mean, we kind of get hung up a lot in the weirdness of Trump um, and all this horrible stuff because he's a horrible person. But if Trump was just a normal president, say, you know, Mike Pence or some kind of boring Republican. <laughs> if, you know, if I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, so the incumbent president in the last six months, more people have died from a disease than any time in the country's history in the last, you know, six months. The economy is the worst that it's been since the depression. How do you think the incumbent's doing? I mean, none of us would say great. 21% um, of the country thinks it's going in the right direction. So, uh, if you look, you know, one of the key metrics to look at is uh, how Trump's doing with 65 plus voters. And if he loses those, it's impossible for him to win. I mean, it's mathematically possible, but it's impossible. And if you look at Florida, he carried them by like 17 points last time and he's losing them now. And I think a lot of that is COVID, which makes sense. 80% of the people who have died from COVID are 65 plus. So, you know, it's what more could a politician do than like kill your friends, kill your family? They're at risk. 
And it's not going to get better under Donald Trump. Um, so I think if the race is about COVID and the economy, Trump can't win. And I think he knows that, which is why he never wants to talk about it. Uh, Bruce had a question. If a primary reason for Republican support is the SCOTUS, once that is secured, might some defect? Uh, wait, read that once more. I'm sorry, make sure I understood it. If a primary reason for Republican support is the SCOTUS, once yeah. that's secured, might some defect? Very interesting question. That's a very smart question. I have no idea. Uh, I think it, you could argue it reduces the intensity of the vote. Um, I think a smarter political move for Trump would have been to say, look, with the Supreme Court, we said this in 2016, we're going to stand by it. We're not going to put this person on the court. But if you vote for me, I'll put this person on the court. So I would, I mean, I think, you know, Justice Barrett is a, a very uh, appealing person. You know, she's not a bad person. You can disagree with her philosophy, but, um, I, you know, I would have put her on the ballot. She's a lot more appealing than Mike Pence. You know, I, I would have said, vote for me, you get her. I think it would have been better. And I think it's killing these Senate candidates like Susan Collins. Um, so uh, I think it was a big blunder. Why did the Republican-led Senate let McConnell stay in power? It's effective. Well, first, you know, if you talk to senators, um, they, uh, in the running, you know, basically, if you're a Republican senator, McConnell kind of runs your life tells you when to be at work and stuff. And from everything I can gather, um, McConnell's very good at that. He's very considerate. He doesn't have votes at terrible times. If you can't make a vote uh, because of some commitment, family, otherwise, um, from what I understand, he's, that's okay, you know, we get it. He, he in that sense, in that little subculture, he's well-liked. Um, he's kind of like a good boss. Um, and um, if you don't go with him on an issue, he doesn't hold grudges because he knows that that's not going to be, okay, I'll get you next time. Um, so I think it's that, really. Um, probably more, you yeah. know, there's this, another side of McConnell we don't see. I, mean, I think he's, he's good with the people in that bubble. Leah has a question. What are your feelings on the Republican Party not having a platform for the 2020 election? Unimaginable. I, I, it, it just, I mean, it's this thing people say, and it's right. You know, Trump kind of says the things you think, but he says them out loud. <laughs> it's the same thing. Like, I, I would have believed that the party would have a platform but not really believe it and it would really be whatever trump said but instead of maintaining that fiction they go with well, no hell we'll just say it's whatever trump says I mean, it's like almost like a saturday night live sketch um I, I look you know i wrote a pretty pessimistic book about the republican party called it was all a lie i uh, finished it about a year ago it turns out i was over optimistic um uh, I, I, listen, when this whole thing happened to the Supreme Court, you know, I looked at what Lindsey Graham had said, and I said, look, Lindsey can't eat that. He can't eat that. Uh, a couple of friends I said that to, they just laughed at me. They go, you're still that naive. And they were right. I mean, the guy didn't slow down. It's like, nope. I mean, at least there's no pretending. <laughs> Karen asks, says we are- in um, Can I reshape that if you don't mind? Um, yeah. I, yeah, in lieu, I was almost, 
Uh, I was almost hoping you wouldn't make a prediction about the election because I have this old uh, wives' tale. You don't say out loud <laughs> what you really hope well, will happen. Any, Karen, if it's any comfort to you, I'm usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, that's none at all. Um, but what I wanted to ask was, in view of how very divisive the, um, you know, the political climate has become, I don't talk to certain neighbors. We have issues within our family. Yep. If, please, please God, what you predicted comes to term, how do you see the Republicans and the Democrats ever finding really finding any common ground to, to, to kind of preserve the union. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, I don't know. Um, it, it is extraordinary how much it's changed. Yes. Um, you know, compromise has become a dirty word. I mean, look at George Bush. He gets elected president. He felt passionately about education. His first big piece of legislation was No Child Left Behind. Oh, go, 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 go Google a picture of him signing No Child Left Behind and Ted Kennedy standing over his right shoulder. <laughs> I mean, today that would be submitted like a war crime evidence. Right. Um, I don't know. Um, I think it's a failure. You know, I, what really makes me angry about these current Republican politicians is they're heir to the greatest generation. And, you know, people like my dad, who, you know, fought three years in the South Pacific, 28 island landings. I mean, he came back like hundreds of thousands of others. And they left this legacy. My uncle, you know, who was shot uh, repeatedly in Germany and never really recovered. But that, that was, they just did that. And you know, courage in standing up to Donald Trump, courage is getting out of the vote when, or getting out of the boat when somebody in front of you got shot. They did that. And these politicians can't stand up to some ridiculous fat guy from Queens. <laughs> I don't get it. I really don't. Um, it's just cowardice. Um, and it breaks my heart because I know and like a lot of these people. So I don't know. Maybe a different generation. Not with these politicians, I think. Hey, Eileen had a question. Thoughts on Lindsey Graham? Can he be beaten by Jamie Harrison, in your opinion? Yes, and I'm a Jamie Harrison donor, and I would urge everybody on this call to donate to Jamie Harrison. Um, it is easier to see how Jamie Harrison gets to 49.5% than 50.1%. Um, but a new poll came out today that showed Donald Trump uh, winning South Carolina by 1%. And if we live in that world, Jamie Harrison's going to win. Actually, I want to make a comment. So my daughter and son-in-law live in Columbia, and they are very actively involved on Jamie Harrison's campaign. Actually, my son-in-law is a tax attorney, and he's been doing a lot of information with tax. And they are very, very optimistic. And I'm glad to hear that you feel we have a shot at it. Thank you. Yeah, you know, in the Lincoln Project, we've sunk a lot of money and time into that race. Um, I find Lindsey Graham sort of the epitome of everything that's wrong with our politics today. I mean, there's just nothing there. Um, it would be great for South Carolina to have Jamie Harrison. Um, they would weirdly become the only state with two African-American senators, which I think would be great for the state. Um, He can win. You know, one of the things you look at these polls and people get all nervous about looking at these battleground state polls because they're close here or there. I mean, they're supposed to be close. That's why we call them battlegrounds. You know, I mean, don't be surprised. Um, but right now, Biden has uh, the largest lead of any candidate in modern political history. It's pretty stable. And I, I don't see it 
changing any way but for the better after last night. Andrew has a question. Why is the Republican Party taking such a strong position against climate change when the science is irrefutable? Probably, you know, there's this weird, uh, weird to me, but, you know, anti-intellectualism that's developed in the Republican Party, an anti-science, an anti-expert, an anti-truth. Um, you know, Governor Bobby Jindal, former Louisiana governor, who's a Rhodes Scholar, um, Indian American immigrant, you know, said about the Republican Party, let's, about 2013, like, don't become a stupid party. And we have become a stupid party. And if you look at COVID-19, it's the complete combination of all that. It's this anti-science, anti-fact, anti-truth, fear of, of government in every sense that government, big government can't do anything good. And that sort of toxic mix ends up with, you know, it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of people dead. But if we had the same death rate as Germany, there'd be 160,000 more people alive. So, you know, you see this in Republicans saying that, you know, college has become this place that students go to get indoctrinated into socialism. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy, but you know, I think about that every time, like, you know, I watch the Ole Miss Alabama game. It's like, really, really think these are breeding grounds for socialism? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. Um, I went to the small liberal arts college called Colorado College, very liberal college. Uh, so did Liz Cheney, so did Lynn Cheney, so did uh, uh, Mary Cheney. We came out of it without being communist, so you know, I think it's ridiculous. Okay, I should go in a minute here. Um, okay. Anything else? Yeah, I've got a lot, so. Oh, sorry. Do you fear for the democracy of our country? Yes, though um, I think we're gonna win, but do I think this is a dangerous fear for democracy? Yes, very much. Um, more so than we realize, because it's hard to grasp the degree to which Trump will go to. Um, I mean, I think, and, and I say this not joking, if you said to Donald Trump, you can be reelected president, but you'll be the last president, he would say, what's the catch? So yeah, I fear, but I think we'll win. Any hope that his taxes will torpedo his chances for reelection? So one of the interesting things last night, Donald Trump definitively said he paid millions of dollars in taxes. Mm -hmm. I think you, I would be surprised. That's like a, a challenge to the New York Times to release those taxes. I would be surprised if those taxes, at least the front pages of it, don't come out. Um, yes, I think it will. If Biden wins, do you think some Republican senators will be more willing to work with the Democrats? Yeah, particularly if they see other Republican senators losing. So if Republicans lose the Senate and then you're a Republican up in 2022, you're going to be asking yourself, like, what did they do that, you know, resulted in them losing? And I think a lot of it will be hyper-partisanship. Um, Biden has made it clear he's going to reach out to, to Republicans. So, yeah, I think it would be. Yeah. Will any Republican leaders ever say out loud, what have I done? I don't know. Uh, Anthony asked a question here. Is it possible that our money-driven campaigns had brought us here? Is it possible that the failure of our generation is because we can no longer breed the Churchills and FDRs that can get us to where we need to be? You know, that's a fantastic question. It's something that I've been thinking about lately. Like, why is it, is there something about our system that is just uh, skewed to drawing weak people? You know, what you have to go through, the fundraising, the sort of bullshit you have to put up with. Um, 
I've become a real radical on campaign finance. I, I would have federal funding for everybody, uh, federal races. Um, so yeah, I think it's a terrible problem. Someone mentioned, how does the Lincoln Project come up with such great ads so quickly if POTUS does something stupid? Oh, um, it's very liberating not to have a client, not to be working for a candidate. Because, you know, in a normal process in a campaign, you come up with an ad. First, you know, the candidate has to like it to prove it. Um, sometimes that involves like the candidate spouse or other people. Um, you have to worry about, um, you know, if you go out and you call, a campaign calls their opponent a liar in an ad, the candidate has to stand by that. Uh, otherwise it's like, well, I don't believe my own ads. So we don't have any of that. We get up in the morning, we decide what we want to do, we do it and we get it after. And, you know, we have these certain skills. We're not bad at this. Um, but I, I think it's unfair to say, look at the Biden campaign, how come they have it? I think they've had really good ads. They're working under different constraints and arguably it's a different purpose. We, we can, if we push too far and it goes like a little too far, it's not going to blow back on Vice President Biden. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's very liberating. Uh, we just get up and do what we, we put it out there. And, um, you know, we made two ads last night during the debate. Mm -hmm. So, um, Alan yeah. has had his hand up for quite a while. Let's let just let him unmute and ask you a quick question. I know you have to go. Alan, you want to unmute yourself? Yes, my question is, uh, how much of Trump's desire to be reelected is because he's afraid that he's going to be indicted in New York State uh, and elsewhere? Man, I don't know. Um, Look, the entire Trump campaign is sort of a large criminal enterprise. I mean, you saw this guy used to be his campaign manager, Brad Parcells, had this total breakdown. And, um, you know, I, I think we ought to clear us in distress and we should be sympathetic to that. But uh, I think Brad Parcells is a crook. Um, and I think that part of the reasons he's having this breakdown is uh, he's realizing it's gonna be exposed. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can also ask, you know, the New York Times says that Donald Trump has over $400 million worth of loans that he's personally guaranteed coming due. So, um, I don't know. This is one of the reasons, you know, we should require people to release tax returns. We should have transparency. You don't know what, what vulnerability they have to blackmail. You just don't know these things. Bruce, I think Bruce wants to say something to you. Yeah, uh, I heard somebody on the media months ago say, if Trump did half as many transgressions as he did, we would find him more disturbing. My question, <laughs> is, my question, yeah. my question is this, uh, I, I go back to the original sin with Obama. How did the media, let Trump slip by by declaring that Obama was not born in this country and he had proof. And after that, I just have another quick question. Do you have any heroes? Ah, um, well, I have lots of heroes in lots of different parts. I mean, my dad is a hero of mine, John McCain. I went to the same high school as he did. He's been a long time hero of mine. Um, you know, I think that Trump has always benefited from the inability to imagine Donald Trump. Um, you know, he's sort of an amusing oddball guy, uh, unless you think he really could be president. And then it's sort of a deadly joke. Um, I think that the inability to imagine that America would ever elect Donald Trump helped Donald Trump a lot. I think when he ran, he wasn't seriously vetted in the beginning that with limited resources, media organizations put their best people on candidates they saw as serious candidates. 
um, the Jeb Bushes, the Marco Rubios, the Ted Cruz, Chris Christie. Um, so I think that helped him a lot. Um, I think a lot of people thought Hillary Clinton was going to win, so there wasn't a necessity for him to vote. Um, it, it's luck, uh, you know, he's arguably the greatest con artist in history. Yeah. All right, guys, listen, I should run. This was Stuart, thank you so much.